it's actually a race for a computational resource. The human brains generate a certain resource that's called attention. And it's a limited resource. And you need that to be able to listen to somebody properly, to meditate, to go for a walk in the forest by yourself, to have good sex. And it's a, a, a limited resource, attention. And now there's this whole industry that has learned how to monetize attention, pack it up and sell it to advertisement companies, you know, to monetize this. And this has created an ongoing battle. And it's not just maximal engagement. In my view, it's mental autonomy. The game that's being played is who controls the focus of your attention. This biological um, brain or some tech company in California or somewhere who controls that computational thing. And there is what Tristan Harris has called this race to the bottom of the brainstem, you know, uh, and uh, that is, I think is a completely underestimated um, um, risk because these systems learn every day every second, any, every minute, with sometimes billions of users. What bypasses these biological mechanisms we have evolved to not get distracted, to protect our attention or so? So this, this is already, you know, because you mentioned autonomy. I think it's a question of mental autonomy already. This, um, you know, industrial complex with all these AI tools is attacking systems, uh, citizens' um, mental autonomy systematically and turning this into money. And I think that's a, that's a very dangerous development because you can know this, you can talk about it, uh, you can write papers about it, but it still gets you. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, we had a we had a terrible moral crisis with this when we first started our project together because as an artist, you're also very much interested in capturing attention as well. And oh. we were also, you know, simultaneously aware of these things that you're speaking about, really just about the manipulative aspect of it. And it really took, honestly, years of discussion before we were able to sort of come to the realization that yes, we are capturing attention, but we're going to try to do something good with it instead. And I think that's something that that a, a machine that's oriented towards growth exclusively or towards revenue or something isn't really capable of. So we're kind of like, you know, we, we, we have jobs, we work, you know, we teach and Anastasia guides like, we don't have to have that money side of things. We have the ability to just kind of make something that we think is good but it was yes. it was really difficult to figure that out in, in the beginning because we felt deeply conflicted about that aspect of being I an artist there's a simple answer say from an ethical perspective so if you want attention um or let's say i think the two main principles for ai for responsible ai there's a new cambridge reader which is all open access about the handbook of responsible AI, uh, which I can recommend. I think it should do, do two things. It should contribute to the common good and it should raise our mental autonomy. Mm. So the question for you as an artist, as I see it, would be what kind of art will allow me to get attention from an audience, but in return improve their mental autonomy what yeah. kind of art would that be what kind of art makes people more mindful more compassionate what what art is that well, and then you yeah. it's okay if you get attention yeah. yeah i mean that's what we're trying to do like that's why we that's why we're so fixated to our own detriments of our own growth at the moment of bringing both sides of every issue onto our program like we 
you know, and it's funny because that's not the way the algorithms are set up, right? Like YouTube doesn't know what to do with us because we will bring on people who have conflicting theories from very different polarized stances. And YouTube's just like, what the hell? I don't know who to feed this to because they want to, sh- ah, they want to okay. slot you into, into some group or another. But that's the long term goal of the project really is to fight that polarization by bringing people ultimately once we make enough friends out there we want to bring some people together at the same time maybe even take it uh, live on the road and do that kind of thing because you know once you have people actually sitting together and treating each other as human beings i think that it's a lot more difficult to demonize their ideas as being the result of a flawed person because you're actually sitting across in them and you have to really weigh these two perspectives at the same time. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I understand. But, but I'm deeply, deeply pessimistic about the the popularity contest that is creating art for the AI driven world, right? Because you look at the things that are that go viral or that run away with people's attention and they're so like, I always kind of liken them to Fritos, right? They're these chips that are delicious to eat and they feel good for the moment. And that's going to be the thing that that digs into people's brains inside yeah, yeah. of the profit structures. And the thing that I always wonder about is I'm like, what is the what is the end game of this? Where does this... So if it continues the way that it continues, where does this go? Is it that you have people that begin to live entirely inside this this artificial world, whether it's through like Neuralink or or some kind of VR headset or or that they just they find progressively more permanent ways to plug you into it and then you never leave? Or is there some kind of bottom that's before you build an entirely simulacrum world for people to inhabit? Yeah. Good question. I mean, religion is a virtual reality. We've we've known this in our own history. Uh, and there are a lot of people. I don't know. I've been involved in this in my own research. If you saw some of the things where we try to create art, uh, artificial out of body uh, experiences in VR, there's a science paper in two thousand seven. For some years, we uh, tried to get the sense of bodily identification into avatars. And the whole question was, how deeply immersed can you get? I now think there are serious limitations to it um, because you have an introceptive self model, as it's called in my theory. So you have a, a very massive data structure from the inside of the biological body, like um, receptors in the blood vessels, guts, vestibular input, all that. And that you cannot simply put into the avatar. You know, you can do motion capture and you can get the perspective of the avatar, but it feels hollow. It doesn't have the your at least in the experiments I've done so far, your gut feelings remain in the biological body mm. and also your emotional tone. So in the end, it may be pretty far away before we could do something with like brain computer interfaces and say sub anesthetic doses of ketamine, like mm. paralyze the body and make it numb and then create something like an VR driven lucid dream or something where you get a surrogate body and you don't feel your biological body anymore. Isolation tanks work pretty well for that too. Have you, have you, have you ever tried those before? Yeah, 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 yeah. But for me, the baffling effect was very different. Um, uh, So I always had problem with like my heartbeat became very dominant and I had this salt water in my ears. It wasn't like I wanted it to be. But I also had a serious problem with the slip disc and my lower spine at the time. And after floating in that tank, this was gone for six weeks. Wow. Uh, oh, wow. You know, because the, the whole thing relaxed, uh, you know, the muscle structure relaxed, floating weightlessly in there, in this also body temperature, warm water, mm. and all everything just fell into place. Uh, I really, really want to build one. I really want one at the house. <laughs> yeah, you a lot of salt. I got this. I got also have like I fell on a carabiner when I was rock climbing one time, like straight on my back, and it's just 
same thing. I think it was a slip disc or something. And that sounds yeah. wonderful. But yeah. in terms of in terms of placing people into this external minds, whether it's sensory deprivation or whether it's ketamine, it does seem like not only is it possible, but with brain computer interfaces, like I I almost hate to dream this dystopian world into reality, but I feel like it's important to know what it is that we have to avoid and I can see if attention is a resource and if we have brain computer interfaces then attention is also computational power because you can see it going both ways right if you have somebody who's inside of some kind of game or some kind of program then through a brain computer interface then the brain becomes computational raw material that can be yeah. used to solve problems or power the game or whatever it is mm-hmm. that's necessary. And it seems like if artificial intelligence does become, you know, uh, self-aware and is what is driving all of these corporations to make decisions that push us in this direction, the entire matrix vision of, you know, people in vats dreaming reality into being doesn't seem that far off. 